This hearing will come to order. This hearing is virtual and as usual, we'll go over a couple of housekeeping matters. For today's, someone needs to uh, mute. For today's meeting, the chair or the staff designated by the chair may mute participants' microphones when they are not under recognition for purpose of eliminating background noise. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves. If I notice you have not unmuted yourself, I will ask you if you'd like the staff to unmute you. If you indicate by nodding for approval, the staff will unmute you. I remind all members and witnesses that the five minute clock still applies. If there's a technology issue, we will move to the next member until the issue is resolved and you will retain the balance of your time. You will notice a clock on your screen and that's showing how much time is remaining. At one minute, the clock will turn yellow. At 30 seconds remaining, I will gently tap the gavel to remind members that their time has almost expired. And when your time has expired, the clock will turn red and I will begin to recognize the next member. In terms of speaking order, we will follow the order set forward in the House rules, beginning with the chair and the ranking member. Members present at the time when the hearing is called to order will be recognized in their order of seniority. And finally, members not present at the time the hearing is called to order. Finally, House rules require me to remind you that we have set up an email address to which members can send anything they wish to submit in writing at any of our hearing markups. The email address has been provided in advance to your staff. So members, uh, the subcommittee uh, will fully come to order now that we took care of the housekeeping. First and foremost, I wish you all a good uh, new year and hope that your families are, are doing well and that they are safe from COVID. What we're going to do this morning is we're going to receive testimony on the impact of the continuing resolution of the Department of Defense and Services. And we're joined by Mike McCord, Under Secretary of Defense, General Dave H. Berger, Commander of the United States Marine Corps, Admiral Michael Gelday, of Chief of Naval Operations of the United States Navy, General Raymond, excuse me, D General John W. Raymond, Chief of uh, Space Operations for the United States Space Force and General uh, Charles Q. Brown, Chief of Staff for the United States Air Force, and General Joseph M. Martin, Vice uh, Chief of Staff for the United States Army. I wanna thank you all for attending. And I would like to mention that uh, Chief Army Staff, uh, General McCondell is not with us today because he is attending General Ornero's uh, internment today. General Ornero is a remarkable leader and General Martin, I wanna thank you for appearing on behalf of the Army today. It has been the case far too often in recent years that the government once again is operating under a continuing resolution. Today's hearing will explore the impacts of CRs on our national security, particularly the problem that would be created by a year long CR for fiscal 2022. When our subcommittee writes a full year bill, um, even the, the year over year total remains the same, we increase and decrease funding for hundreds of specific activities that are essential to our national security. Under a CR, none of this occurs. We do not cut spending in areas where it's no longer needed, like sunsetting legacy platforms or inefficient programs that are no longer survivable in a high-end fight. Simply put, CRs are bad for our national security they increase inefficiency, they waste taxpayers' money. They also signal to our troops and the millions of workers in the defense industry that their needs are just not a priority. At a time when Putin is threatening to invade Ukraine, China continues to be a pacing threat, we do not have time to waste. Our national security cannot afford more CRs. Now, among the members of this committee, I wanna be perfectly clear. I know each and every one of you all wants a new fiscal year 2022 defense bill. But I have to tell you, it is frustrating to read quotes from one House Republican published in December, and I'm gonna quote directly. Republicans should be in favor of a CR until Biden's out of office. It would be the proper Republican thing to do and everybody saying otherwise is foolish. Well, that type of fool, 
thinking that's what's foolish, and I believe it's dangerous. I've heard similar comments from other Republicans in recent months. The least we can do is to get funding bills done. And I thank Chair uh, DeLauro for trying to do just that for months now. I urge my Republican colleagues to continue to come to, with us to the negotiating table so we can fund the entire government. But because America's national security is more than just about dollars that we provide the Pentagon, is part of the reason why we're having this hearing. We also need to make the necessary investments in diplomacy, development abroad, and most importantly, education, health, and America's economy here at home. They all impact our national security. So today I look forward from hearing to our witnesses about how a full year CR could affect modernization, slow our ability to retire ineffective programs, and how it would be an inefficient use of taxpayers' dollars by directing billions of dollars to purposes that are out of date, such as a war in Afghanistan, which we're no longer fighting. We have a lot to cover. And so now I will turn to the gentleman from California, um, the ranking member, Mr. Calvert, for his opening remarks. Mr. Calvert. Well, thank you, Madam Chairman, and Happy New Year. And uh, I also want to recognize uh, General Ordinaro. Uh, not only was he a great patriot, a good friend of this committee, and uh, we certainly thank him and his family for his lifetime of service. Uh, I wanna thank uh, all the witnesses uh, for being here today. Uh, while I look forward to hearing from the senior leaders here today, I'm disappointed there's a need to have this hearing. Since I've joined this subcommittee, I've been very vocal about the damage done by our inability to pass defense appropriation bills on time. When we're able to carry out the most when we're able, unable to carry out the most fundamental constitutional responsibility to create self-inflicted wounds that are difficult to recover from. Typically, as appropriators, we're able to negotiate in good faith, reach a bipartisan deal. Unfortunately, my friends on the other side of the aisle have uh, decided they're more committed to the progressive wing of their party than to the responsible governance of this country. We have offered to start negotiations as long as we work under the same terms negotiations that we have worked for in the past two years. They are simply no poison pills and retain all legacy writers. We've also made clear that in order for us to support these bills, domestic spending must come down and defense spending must go up. It should be noted that the HAS, the SASC, and the Senate appropriations all have agreed to a higher defense number. This committee is the lone holdup. It is disappointing to watch the majority try to blame Republicans, who are the minority party in both chambers, for being at this unfortunate place, especially when it's their leadership that's failed them. May I remind people that Democrats were unable to pass their version of the fiscal 2022 defense appropriation bills on the House floor. And today, under the guise of caring for our men and women in uniform, they're attempting to use the Department of Defense as a means to an end with the hopes of passing radical, irresponsible policies that will harm the American people. It's disingenuous at best, and it breaks the longstanding tradition of bipartisan cooperation that has made this committee, and especially this subcommittee, specifically so effective. The excessive spending on the domestic bills is irresponsible and will dangerously add to our national debt, which former Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Admiral Bond, called top threat to our national security. These increases are also in addition to the massive spending spree that the Biden administration and this Congress have been on, which has directly led to massive inflation. As a matter of fact, the number came out this morning, 7% inflation this year, the highest number in almost 40 years, which is harming American families and certainly harming the Department of Defense. I'll remind everyone that inflation is drastically harming DOD's own buying power. When you account for COVID spending, when you account for COVID spending on national security and national uh, and on national security, our entire, sp entire spending on national security is 10% of all federal outlets, 10%. The overwhelming majority of our spending goes towards domestic programs. As a ranking member of this subcommittee, I've remained firm in my resolve that we will fight to ensure proper funding for the Department of Defense. It's encouraging to hear reports that the majority is now considering supporting additional funds above the president's misguided request 
for fiscal year 2022. It's my hope we can avoid devastating impacts uh, of, of a CR. We'll hear about this today. Uh, committees, this committee's storied reputation of bipartisan common sense governing, I hope will continue. Thank you for your service, and I look forward to your testimony. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Calvert. And I certainly know that the words that you said were heartfelt, but I don't think you meant to imply that any of us on this committee from the other side of the aisle are disingenuous. Um, I would now recognize Chair DeLauro. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. I want to thank you and the ranking member uh, for holding uh, this important hearing on the impact of continuing resolutions and what they have, um, uh, the kind of impact they have on the Department of Defense. I first want to just say a thank you. Uh, and uh, 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 Secretary of Defense Austin is not here this morning, uh, but on December 6th, he issued a statement uh, about the contents of what we're speaking about today and uh, what the, um, uh, 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 how, uh, what he described, uh, uh, a fiscally unsound way of funding the Department of Defense and government as a whole. So please convey my thanks to him. I wanna say a thank you to all of our witnesses today. It was amazing to me in reading through the testimony um, of uh, the consistency uh, of, of message uh, here about um, what in fact uh, occurs uh, when we engage uh, in continuing resolutions. If I might, and I don't mean to slight the others, but uh, G General Brown, uh, I thank you for your, 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 your authorship of the book, Accelerate, Change, or Lose, uh, that we must change so that we do not um, go backward. Uh, the time for us has come. Uh, we need to go faster. Uh, and, and, and the time is now for us to be able uh, 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 to do that. Uh, and I appreciate the witnesses and their uh, distinguished leaders of the military coming to explain the consequences of what are, quite frankly, Congress's failures. Madam Chair, uh, I, 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 uh, uh, you and I have worked closely for months to enact a defense appropriations bill for fiscal year uh, 2022. Um, but while, um, and I, I too would agree with you that the members of this subcommittee are committed to um, a uh, moving forward uh, on a defense appropriations uh, bill. Uh, but while the Democrats are ready to negotiate and complete our work, a number of our Republican colleagues um, have, they have not even, uh, leadership hasn't even offered a proposal of their own. And just, I have to, say this, I, I, I wasn't go going to, but uh, just to clarify the record, uh, the fact of the matter is in the history of appropriations uh, 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 bills, the issues on uh, whether you call them policy riders or poison pills or legacy riders, whatever you want to call them, that has been debated at the end of the process, that there has been the willingness on the part of Democrats and Republicans to come together and say, let us talk about the top line. Let us move programmatically, because in order to achieve a bicameral, bipartisan piece of legislation, those issues will be um, uh, will have to be resolved. So the fact that of who is, uh, it's not a question of pointing fingers, but the uh, Democratic proposals are out there. To date, there has not been one single document that outlines where our Republican colleagues want to go. President Kennedy once said, there are risks and costs to action, but they are far less than the long range risks of comfortable inaction. We need action on full year funding bills, funding bills now. The longer our colleagues get comfortable in their inaction, the greater the long range risks will be for our nation. And as you are, Madam Chair, I'm particularly alarmed by the suggestion of some that they would prefer to fund the government under a full year continuing resolution. This would harm our military, stalling modernization efforts, readiness, capacity, recruitment, operation and maintenance, impacting pay for our troops and wasting billions in taxpayers dollar on capabilities we no longer need. After 20 years of war in Afghanistan have ended, we need to prepare for the security challenges of the future by modernizing weapon systems, such as strengthening our hypersonic weapons and artificial intelligence capabilities. A continuing resolution was to severely curtail 
the transition to these modern high quality tools. Uh, readiness is essential to the strength of our military. But as the testimony from our witnesses affirm, uh, extended CRs, full year CR, would greatly impact our troops, their quality of life, their health care. Under a continuing resolution, services would have to significantly curtail other personnel expenses, including potentially slashing the number of new recruits to provide a statutorily authorized pay raise. Uh, the witnesses uh, in their testimony, they lay out, as I mentioned earlier, a consistent message that asserts that already there are serious consequences to the four month delay of, 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 a, of a budget agreement. A full year continuing resolution would keep platforms and systems that are no longer necessary in service while blocking the start of new projects. It would reduce the buying power of the Defense Department, lock the Pentagon into last year's spending, such as for a war in Afghanistan we are no longer fighting. There are few dollars, more egregious uh, ways to waste the Americans' uh, uh, people's hard-earned tax dollars. Finally, I'm deeply concerned about the impact of a full year CR on the millions of jobs the defense industry sustains across the United States. And I ask unanimous consent to insert into a record into the record, a letter from 11 defense trade associations, which puts the harmful consequences of a full year CR in stark terms. And I quote, defense industry workforces are subject to seemingly endless stop and start contract cycles, creating inefficiency and disruption that ripples through the defense supply chain with disproportionate effects on smaller companies, end quote. The consequences of a full year CR are simply unthinkable to protect our national security, sustain American strength vis-a-vis -vis China and Russia, and further American leadership around the world. We need a government funding agreement. We need it now. And it is time for our Republican colleagues to join us, negotiate a bipartisan, bicameral funding agreement. I thank you, Madam Chair, for holding this hearing. And I thank our witnesses once again. And I won't deal with the quote now because I've already gone over my time, but I'm hopeful that uh, 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 Assistant Defense Secretary McCord um, will speak about um, uh, this issue. He has a great quote in his, um, in his uh, a, a testimony about uh, our competition with Russia and China and what they do um, in terms of being competitive and what we do not do. I say thank you and thank you to my colleagues um, uh, uh, for being here this morning and I yield back. Thank you, Chair Delora. Uh, Delora. Uh, you had, you said 11, uh, 11 letters to enter for the record? Uh, no, one letter that has been signed by 11 heads of okay. the uh, trade association, no, aerospace, no. air force, I just wanted to make sure I said the amount of letters correctly. That's so right. without right. objection, we will be entering that letter into the record. Thank you. Now I turn to um, Ranking Member Granger from Texas for her opening remarks. Ms. Granger. Can you speak now? Uh, thank you, Chairman McCollum. Um, as a longtime member and a former chair of this subcommittee, I've been proud of its history of bipartisanship. The members of this subcommittee care deeply about our national security and have been able to put partisan politics aside in order to ensure we provide the funding needed to protect our great nation. Unfortunately, the defense appropriation bill has fallen victim to partisan politics. I think we would all agree that no one here wants a continuing resolution. No one. That's not our goal. However, Republicans will not allow the majority to ram through irresponsible spending and harmful policies and other parts of the government by using the Department of Defense as a political weapon. My position should not come as a surprise to anyone. During full committee and subcommittee markups, I made it clear that House Republicans would not support any bills unless the majority removed poison pills, reinstated long-standing riders, and addressed the disparity between defense and non-defense spending. Those two is three issues have been for the past two years as a part of this. But instead of working across the aisle to get our work done, the majority drafted unrealistic, irresponsible appropriations bills, many of which contain 
the most partisan policies I have seen since I've been in Congress. For example, the FY22 Labor, Health, and Human Services Bill includes a staggering 36% increase over current levels. The majority also removed longstanding bipartisan pro-life prote protections that have been included for decades. The list goes on and on. As appropriators, we know it takes bipartisan cooperation to craft spending bills that will be signed into law. Counter to what the majority has said, Republicans are ready and willing to negotiate. We simply ask that the majority agree to the same terms that have, have allowed us to complete our work quickly in the past, drop controversial language and restore longstanding provisions. If the majority would agree to these terms, I will clear my schedule and I'm happy to begin negotiations immediately following this hearing. Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Bottom line is people need to get to the table and talk to each other. And uh, that 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 is leadership in both the House and the Senate. Um, so I'm going to turn to our witnesses now. And I we don't pick favorites. I don't pick favorites, especially on my side of the family. When my father was Army Air Corps, I never picked a favorite between the two of them. So we're going to start with the service chiefs. We're going to go in alphabetical order, then followed by the vice uh, chief uh, Martin and McCord. Uh, your full statements are going to be entered into the record, so I ask you to limit your remarks to no more than five minutes. Under Secretary McCord, you are first. Well, uh, and also, Chair DeLauro and Ranking Member Granger, thank you, uh, members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today, along with our leaders from the services on the importance of getting full year appropriations rather than seeing continued extensions of the current continuing resolution or CR. In particular, I want to express our concerns about the potential for a full year CR, which is something the department has never been forced to operate under. Our military leaders are going to speak in more detail about specific impacts on their services and their people. But let me begin with some points that are of concern across the department to amplify the points Secretary Austin made in his statement of December 6th. 2021, which I would ask uh, the chair that you allow to be inserted in the record of this hearing also. Without objection. Thank you. Uh, a full year CR uh, chair and members would, would move us in the wrong direction and leave us stuck in the wrong place. First, if you want us to be more competitive with our adversaries, it's going to make us less so. If you want us to be more agile, a CR has the opposite effect. It would undermine our, your support of our men and women in, in uniform and their families. Finally, Congress, in passing the recently enacted FY22 Defense Authorization Bill, was voting in part to increase DOD funding. If that is what Congress wants, enacting a full year CR would send our, our top line down, not up. Let me now briefly expand on a few of these concerns. First, as I believe you are all aware, a full year CR would reduce our funding level below what we requested and what we believe we need. On the surface, at the department level as a whole, the reduction to our accounts would appear to be about $8 billion below our request, which would be significant even if that was the only impact. The actual reduction in practice will be much greater because we would have significant funding that's misaligned, trapped, or frozen in the wrong places and unusable because we don't have the tools or flexibility to realign funds on anything like the scale we would need to fix all the problems that the chiefs are going to describe. To cite one major example, although it's a different subcommittee, I know all of you are very familiar with the fact that virtually all military construction projects in each year's budget, including the FY22 budget, are new starts that cannot be executed under a CR. In this specific case, that's over 100 projects and over $5 billion in funding that would be unusable. So that's one example of on top of the $8 billion that it looks like at, at the gross level when you get down in the details. If you add the impacts of this unusable funding to the straight loss of purchasing power under a CR, the real impacts on our operations and programs will double or triple the, the impact of the cuts. As we go into the procurement and the research and development accounts to calculate all the funding tied to individual program rate increases or new starts that we would not be able to execute, leaving those funds stranded. Not every acquisition program would be restricted and impacts would be very uneven. Some programs such as the ground-based strategic deterrent would be delayed significantly by the cuts imposed by a CR, while others such as the procurement of two Virginia-class submarines might be relatively unaffected. 
The most damaging impacts would be on those who deserve it least, our service members and their families. The biggest tolls would be in our military personnel accounts and our training and readiness accounts. Our military personnel accounts will be funded $5 billion below our requested level under a CR. Yet inside those flat funding levels, as several members have noted, we would have to absorb the cost of a well-deserved pay raise and other statutory housing and subsistence increases for the troops. This means that within, within a flat number absorbing a pay raise, we will be forced to take actions such as delaying and suspending permanent change of station moves for our people and delaying accessions of new troops, which would disrupt our training pipeline. In the operating accounts, where a CR would leave us another $5.3 billion below our requested levels, we would almost certainly have to defer training and readiness and take greater risk in our facilities maintenance, especially if we endeavor to avoid any furloughs of our civilian workforce, because civilian pay is a very large part of the operating accounts. We also have an issue with military health care. This account would be short by over a billion dollars compared to our request, yet we have no ability to control the demand for health care by our beneficiaries, nor would we wish to. Uh, especially during a pandemic. So people show up to the doctor, we have to pay that bill. Some might ask, well, can't we address these issues by reprogramming funds to solve our biggest problems? First, the committees have never approved a reprogramming during a continuing resolution. If we get past that issue as we would need to under a year long CR just to fix one high impact problem, such as the billion dollar shortfall in the ground-based strategic deterrent program would consume 25% of the $4 billion in transfer authority available to me for the entire department for the entire year. And yet I would still have dozens of other CR imposed problems to address. The idea that being under a continuing resolution into January or February is not unusual and that a full year CR is now considered a serious possibility did not come from nowhere. And I believe it's important just to take a moment to step back from this current situation and look at the broader context. We've been slowly boiling this frog for a number of years and we may not fully appreciate what's been happening. For the 20 years that followed the end of the Cold War, from fiscal years 1991 through 2010, the date of enactment of the Defense Appropriations Bill averaged 24 days into the fiscal year, or less than a month late. But since the enactment of the Budget Control Act in FY 2011, the 10 years of the BCA that then followed that enactment, and now this first year after the BCA, that average has ballooned to 118 days late over the last 12 years, assuming that we could land this plane on February 18th this year. The six longest CRs in the history of the Defense Department have all occurred in this last 12-year period. We have turned a 12-month fiscal year into an eight-month fiscal year in terms of our ability to initiate new starts and enter contracts. This should be unacceptable and not the new normal. It's hard to see this full impact because, or, or in the inefficiency from looking from outside because the organization has, of course, adapted to its circumstances, just as organisms do. Nobody plans to enter into contracts in the first quarter of a fiscal year now because the odds that we would actually be able to do so are so low. Therefore, we in turn have no significant contract delays to report to you when we're under a CR. In addition to the direct consequences of a CR, including with the inefficiency, the disruption to our people and our operations and reduction in the resources that I have described, we should not forget that inflation is also eating into our funding while our funding remains on hold as, as Mr. Calvert noted. For example, I've had to improve, approve two increases in our fuel prices this year already, first on October 1st and a second one on January 1st in order to keep our, our working capital fund solvent. So this has created a bill of a billion and a half dollars to the services for FY22 in addition to the reductions that we already have described. And finally, uh, to be clear, the department's not alone in this regard. We recognize that. In fact, we have been treated better over the years than some other agencies. The Department of Health and Human Services is on the front lines against the COVID-19 pandemic. We have attacks on our critical infrastructure and natural disasters that we expect the Department of Homeland Security to respond to. Uh, we have to ensure our children get the quality education they need to become the trained and capable workforce of tomorrow. So we can't afford to run the federal government, any agency on a long year, on a year long CR. Our competitors, China and Russia in particular, use all the pieces on the chessboard to compete with us, not just their military assets. We're competing on the diplomatic front, the economic front, the military front, innovation and technology. If we take this competition seriously as we should and as our adversaries do, then we cannot afford to continue acting this way. Time is money and year after year, we're giving away time in these lengthy CRs. We do not have such an insurmountable edge on our competitors that we can afford to keep doing this. Let me close, Chair and turn over to our military leaders for more specifics by quoting what Secretary Austin said last month. 
quote, I strongly urge Congress to seize this opportunity to sustain American competitiveness, advance American leadership, and enable our forces by immediately reaching a bipartisan, bicameral agreement on, on a full year FY22 appropriations. It's not only the right thing to do, but it's the best thing that they can do for our nation's defense. With that, I look forward to, to your questions once all the witnesses have concluded their statements. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, and thank you for the uh, accessibility our office, and I know other offices that serve on this committee have had for questions, um, especially during uh, the um, seriousness of the Afghan refugees. Thank you very much for your, your work and your professionalism. General uh, Berger, you're next. Chairman McCollum, Ranking Member Calvert, Chair DeLora, and Ranking Member Granger, and the other distinguished members of the subcommittee, thanks for the opportunity to appear before you today. Last spring, uh, at the FY22 posture hearing, I updated this committee on the force design effort. The Marine Corps began in 2019. We're now two and a half years uh, into that major effort. Force Design 2030 is how your Marine Corps is adjusting for the future in order to match the operating environment and to stay in front of our adversaries. With that in mind, I'd offer three ways uh, that a year-long continuing resolution, which as noted, we've never had before, would have a much greater uh, adverse impact than previous year continuing resolutions. And I'll start with people, your Marines and their families. Now, if we were a conscript force, we wouldn't worry much about an impact of an extended CR. But an all-volunteer force, on the other hand, relies on volunteers. Volunteers to enlist, volunteers to stay in service. CRs eat away at the trust those Marines and their families have in their government. With no appropriations, I will have to delay and cancel some transfer orders. Incentive pays and bonuses reduced. Families won't know whether to renew their housing leases. Spouses won't know whether to accept the job offer they got last week, all due to uncertainty. The impacts on recruiting and retention will last, I'm confident, well beyond 2022 because you cannot rebuild trust in a week or a month or a year, not in an all-volunteer force. Second, for the Marine Corps, impacts on modernization and the industrial base are especially acute as a result of force design decisions I've taken over the past few years. We've already divested of old and begun to reinvest in new, which was a prudent plan that this committee recommended I take and each of you has fully supported to date. Continuing resolutions, however, look in one direction, backward. They execute last year's budget against this year's priorities. CRs effectively prevent modernization at speed, the speed required for us to keep up the pace that our adversaries have set and sustained. And here's the thing about that. We actually stand to be outpaced by China, not because of their speed, but because of our failure to comply with our own budgetary processes. Time is the one critical resource, as the Undersecretary pointed out, we need to affect real change and no amount of resources in the future can buy back lost time. Under a full year CR, we will delay acquisition of critical Marine Corps force design programs. MQ-9 aid procurement won't happen. Production increases for F-35Bs, KC-130Js, CH-53K aircraft, the amphibious combat vehicle, won't happen. Workers in Southern California, York, Pennsylvania, Dallas, Fort Worth, Camden, Arkansas, Tucson, Arizona, Stratford, Connecticut, and a dozen other locations will be affected. Those workers need predictability. Actually, there is one predictable outcome of a year long CR, and that is that those workers will go elsewhere because they have families to support. Third, we face the prospect of losing the trust and confidence of our allies and partners because commanders will have to scale back the scheduled exercises they have for this year. And in some cases, they'll need to cancel. Well, that's only relevant if your national security strategy depends on allies and partners. Ours does. Trust is a big part of what keeps the door open with our partners. Once that door closes, it's really hard to recover from the damage done to the military relationships. We should anticipate that some of them will begin to look elsewhere 
for a more reliable, dependable partner. One final point. Sadly, as pointed out, as a military, we've become accustomed to a process that fails to deliver a budget on time. And over the past decade of CRs, we've learned how to adjust our operating and contracting practices for the continuing resolution that we just assume is going to happen. at behaving badly. If the past 10 budget cycles are prologue, we'll be meeting here again next year to talk about the same things. During that time, the Chinese will launch more than a dozen new surface combatants. They'll launch patrol craft carrier capable of carrying long range anti-ship cruise missiles. They'll field additional squadrons of fifth generation aircraft. We can't afford to have that meeting here next year. Service chiefs need sufficient, stable, predictable funding to stay in front of our pacing threat, to deter our adversaries, and if need be, to fight and win. Now, we haven't taken any of these extreme actions, not yet. This train wreck in front of us is entirely preventable. Again, thanks for the opportunity to appear here this morning. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, sir. Admiral Gilday, you're up next, please. Chair McCollum, Ranking Member Calvert, Chair DeLauro, uh, Ranking Member Granger, and other distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify uh, with my fellow service chiefs this morning. And Mr. McCord as well. The peace dividend has long passed. We are now in a relentless race with peer competitor. Every day matters in this critical decade. In the face of a rising China, Navy's top line, in other words, our buying power, has been relatively flat for more than a decade. A year-long CR will cost us time that can't be recovered and have irreversible impact to some of our most important programs. This is exacerbated during a time when we're still fighting the pandemic, as well as, as rank Ranking Member Calvin uh, mentioned a 7% inflation rate on a budget, 60% of which already rises above the rate of inflation. I'd like to briefly summarize what I see as the major impacts in three areas. The first is strategically. The impacts of a year long CR will further erode our ability to credibly deter our adversary. A year long CR will yield a smaller, less ready, less capable, and less lethal United States Navy. It'll have significant impacts to readiness, modernization, and shipbuilding. The work that we are pursuing, the once in a century work on our public shipyards will come to a stop. The work that we are doing to invest in a new SSBN, the most, the most survivable leg of our strategic triad will be put at risk. The Sir, you've lost your audio, if you can hear me. Can you hear me, ma'am? I can hear you now. Thank you. Yeah, I mentioned the impacts in the Columbia program, our SSBN, the most survivable leg of the triad, and the fact that uh, uh, that program has no margin as it replaces submarines that have been in the water for four decades. And lastly, importantly, game-changing uh, investments that we're making in hypersonics and laser weapons will also be impacted. The second area the Commandant covered, uh, I'll, I'll briefly cover as well, and that's people. We'll reduce the sessions by almost 75% and we'll delay uh, or cancel uh, change of station moves by more than 50%. As the Commandant mentioned, families have already been planning for that. Spouses have already been accepting jobs or planning to relocate. We will, we will withhold re-enlistment bonuses and special incentive bonuses that keep our best sailors and their families in the United States Navy. And importantly, we will exacerbate a say-do gap that risks breaking trust, that further risks breaking trust with sailors and their families. 
And the last area that I think it's important to highlight, at least for the Navy, is the impact on the defense industrial base. The impact of COVID and inflation, as I've already mentioned, will be magnified by a year-long CR. It'll hurt shipbuilders, it'll hurt aircraft manufacturers, and small, innovative, high-tech companies in all of your districts that have made significant investments on their own in both infrastructure and their workforce to make us a stronger, more capable military. As others have stated, we are well accustomed to adjusting to short-term CRs as, as, as much as they are inefficient and costly but we've become good at it. A year long CR is completely new territory that we have not dealt with before that'll have significant impacts across our military. Our Navy is grateful for the subcommittee's support and I look forward to filling your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, testimony. Uh, General Raymond, please. Chair McCollum, Ranking Member Calvert, Chair DeLauro, Ranking Member Granger, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify virtually with Mr. McCord and my fellow service chiefs. I also wanna thank this committee for your continued leadership and support of the guardians who I'm privileged to serve alongside with. The primary focus of the Space Force is to deliver capabilities that give our forces the freedom to maneuver in the time, place, and domain of our choosing. That includes land, sea, air, cyber, and space. We are working to do this at speed, focusing on our core missions and working closely with this committee as we stand up this force. As you know, space is a contested domain. Threats are increasing and adversaries are challenging our dominance. China recently launched a hypersonic glide vehicle in a fractional, in a fractional orbit likely capable of delivering weapons. If we can't track it, we can't defeat it. Russia's recent anti-satellite test, which shattered a defunct Russian satellite into thousands of pieces of debris, also threatened the freedom of our forces to operate in the time and place of our choosing. Our adversaries are accelerating. This is not the time to be slowing the development and fielding of modernized capabilities for our forces. Please allow me to detail how a long-term CR will hurt our ability to address these and other threats. A year-long CR would reduce the Space Force's top-line budget by $2 billion, slowing modernization, uh, decreasing readiness, and impacting our ability to compete and deter with China and Russia. It would decrease research and development for resilient missile warning and missile tracking. It would, uh, and for space domain awareness, protected satellite communications, and precision navigation and timing, all of which are critical capabilities that the joint force needs to operate effectively. It would slow our ability to manage risk and inform future force designs, delaying our ability to modernize to resilient and more mission-capable architectures in the face of growing threats. It would cut the procurement of two of five planned national security space launch missions, delaying our ability to place previously acquired capability on orbit and putting at risk the cost savings of the National Space uh, Launch Program. It would cut, excuse me, it would cut 800 million intended for development of classified operational systems designed to deter China and Russia and respond if deterrence fails. And I can fully describe these capabilities in a closed session. And lastly, most important, it would break trust with our guardians and their families. Because we were established as a lean mission focused force, we continue to rely on the Air Force's airmen and family programs to support our guardians. General Brown will describe negative impacts to pay, recruiting, retention, airmen programs, all of which would have long term lasting effects on our guardians and their families as well. A continuing resolution would undoubtedly have negative impacts across the entirety of the Joint Force, but the effects of the Space Force are particularly acute as we stand up. It would seriously compromise our ability to enhance unity of effort and efficiency, gener generate mission-ready forces, and deliver the new capabilities that Joint Force needs to deter and prevail. 
thank you for this opportunity to testify and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. We will now turn to General Brown. General Brown, please. Chair Kamal McCullough, Ranking Member Calvert, Chair DeLauro, uh, Ranking Member Granger, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify for Mr. McCord and my uh, fellow service chiefs and to testify on behalf of the 689,000 total force airmen of your United States Air Force. As the nation's 22nd Air Force Chief of Staff, I'm humbled to uphold my responsibility to ensure our airmen and our Air Force remain the greatest in the world, both today and tomorrow. As I see my position, I, I wrote Accelerate Change or Lose. And over the last 17 months, I've made collaboration a priority to enable acceleration. Back since August of 2020, I've engaged with Congress members and staffers nearly 200 times because I believe we must work together on our Air, Force, Air Force's future and our nation's security. I am pleased that fiscal year 2022 National Defense Authorization Act made significant progress. But as you understand, the goals of this important policy will be unrealized absent the dedicated service of this committee and their counterparts to pass an appropriation bill. Unfortunately, a year long continued resolution would stall progress towards today's readiness and tomorrow's modernization. Bottom line, would have devastating impacts on the Air Force's ability to retain quality airmen, maintain our readiness, and modernize for tomorrow. Specifically, we would lose $3.5 billion in purchasing power if held to fiscal 2021 budget levels. As much as, as this affects our Air Force fiscally, the impact it has on our rate of change is more shattering. Time is irrecoverable. And when you're working to keep pace against well-resourced and focused competitors, time matters. Year-long continuing resolution would hinder our airmen's readiness, resilience, and retention. If held to fiscal year 2021, funding the Air Force's military personnel account could lose up to $1 billion. Critical annual and professional military training for our Guard and Reserve Airmen will be curtailed or canceled. Vital funding for Airmen and Guardian programs, programs addressing sexual assault and harassment, suicide prevention, diversity and inclusion, could also be eliminated at a time when they are most needed. Additionally, you can eliminate essential incentive and retention bonuses, eroding Airmen's trust across current and future eligible year groups. The year long CR could force reductions in our flying hour program weapons and sustainment, and facility sustainment restoration and modernization accounts. It could also slow down and or freeze hiring of civilians, all impacting Air Force capability, capacity, and readiness. Year-long CR could uh, impact billions of dollars in worldwide military construction, 78 new start programs for active guard and reserve components for programs such as the ground-based strategic deterrent, B-21, AC-46, F-35, F-16, and C-130. Further, it will affect vital mission growth at the Air Force bases in four states and International Guard location across nine uh, states. Four areas of modernization I want to highlight are the nuclear enterprise, advanced weapons, air dominance platforms, enterprise information technology structure. Year-long CR could irreversibly delay ground-based strategic return initial operating capability past 2029 long-range standoff weapon by over a year, and the conventional initial operation capability and nuclear certification of the B-21 up to a year. Additionally, the advancement of our two conventional hypersonic weapons could be prevented. I would like to point out that our pacing challenges have either modernized our nuclear enterprise and or our fielding hypersonic systems. Meanwhile, we are still in the beginning phases of both. Moreover, funding for next generation air dominance, our sixth generation tactical aircraft system enabling future air security could be reduced. Finally, vital funding to enterprise information technology modernization could be eliminated, increasing network vulnerability and impacting our contribution to joint all domain uh, command and control infrastructure. Although a young, year, year long uh, CR would decrease our funding, the greater loss would be time. Time that could uh, we could have spent accelerating today's readiness and tomorrow's modernization. Meanwhile, our competitors' rate of change is enabling them to achieve, approach parity with many of our warfighting capabilities and concepts. The year-long CR further erode our advantage and impede the Air Force's acceleration towards the force tomorrow. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, General. And now we will hear from General Martin. Please, sir, the time is yours. 
Chair McCollum, Ranking Member Calvert, Chair DeLauro, and Ranking Member Granger, and distinguished members of the subcommittee on the behalf of the Secretary of the Ar Army, the Honorable Christine Warmerth, and the Chief of Staff of the Army, General James McConville, thank you for inviting me here today to testify and discuss the impact of continuing resolutions on the Department of the Army. And I also want to especially thank you for recognizing the service of General Odierno. It's a huge loss. The Army by Doctrine is the nation's initial response force to emergent threats. Last year, the Army contributed over 50% of the joint forces provided to combatant commanders and 66% of the composite directed readiness table supporting operational planning requirements. This included responding to and providing continued support through the COVID-19 pandemic, civil unrest, natural disasters, supported our southern border, and the security of the national capital. Total joint emergent costs to the FY21 Global Force Management Allocation Plan were $2.8 billion, of which the Army contributed $1.6 billion, or 56% of the total emergent costs. The Army responded to these unforeseen requirements, all while continuing to deter aggression abroad, strengthen relationships with our allies and partners, conduct counterterrorism ter operations around the world, and maintain the readiness of our soldiers and our DAC civilians in preparation for the next mission, whatever that may be. Simultaneously, to keep pace with any potential adversaries, we're currently undergoing the most significant transformation effort in the past 40 years to provide the joint force with the most capable and lethal land army in the world. The ability of the Army to accomplish these diverse tasks wouldn't be possible without the support for Congress, and we sincerely thank you for that. However, readiness is fragile, and I can't emphasize enough how important timely, adequate, predictable, and sustained funding is to keeping the Army at the highest state of readiness possible, because who knows what tomorrow will bring. Over the past 10 years, the Department of Defense has started all but one fiscal year under a CR. Although we've adapted our business practices to maneuver through this fiscal uncertainty and the effects of the short duration CRs, a full year CR would adversely affect our soldiers, our, soldiers, our readiness, our modernization program, and our infrastructure improvement efforts. Monetarily, we assess the total impact of the Army under a year-long CR could be as high as $12.9 billion. The impact is even larger when considering the effects, uh, the effects of inflation. Included in this number are misaligned funds, as well as funding, funding spread across military pay, research and acquisition programs, military construction projects, and family housing initiatives. A few impacts to readiness include pilot readiness due to reduced aviation flying hours, also to base operations support, and a decreased ability to send soldiers to professional military education and properly maintain proficiency in our formations and maintain the readiness of the equipment that they use. A full year CR would severely impact our ability to modernize to meet tomorrow's challenges. The combined effect of delays in procurement and prototype advancement on top of a disruption in timelines for development and construction of critical Army and joint technologies may very well create a, a cumulative impact to our modernization initiatives that would be difficult to overcome. This includes potential impacts to modernization of our organic industrial base. In summary, a year-long CR would cause severe impacts to the Army's ability to care for our soldiers and our families, to our readiness and capability to respond to emerging operational requirements, and to our ability to make the necessary funding decisions required to modernize our force. The Army strongly urges Congress to pass all FY22 appropriation bills to avoid the complex and undesirable effects of a year-long CR. Again, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to testify before you today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you so much, uh, General Martin, and thank you for, for stepping in. 
Um, once again, I just want to reiterate, I truly believe it is the wish, the desire, the, um, the commitment from our entire committee, both sides of the aisle, not to have a year long CR and to get our job done. Before we turn to other member questions, I want to enter into the record secretary Austin's statement from December, as well as a letter from several defense trade groups, a statement from the aerospace industry association. A letter from the National Defense Industrial Association on the harmful impacts a, a full year CR would have on our national security. So, without objection, those letters will be entered. Now, I'm going to turn to questions. And um, as it's been the custom and usage, um, the ranking member and I sometimes go a little over five minutes. So, we haven't had a, a, a timer on, but I do have the timer running on my uh my iphone so i don't uh, abuse uh, the the uh, opportunity that our other committee members have given um mr calvert and i and i'm going to extend that same courtesy to um the full committee chair and to um the full committee ranking member uh, when we start with questions so i'm going to uh, start first and uh, the top line of a full CR would technically stay the same as has been pointed out, but things like pay raises and inflation, uh, as long with funds that simply could not be spent in 2022, such as $3 billion for Afghan security forces, mean that DOD and the services would actually face substantial cuts from uh, uh, 2021 to 2022. And you've had that in your testimony, but I just want to reiterate it. A full year long CR is a cut and none of us on this subcommittee want that uh, to, to happen in, in such a callous way. Additionally, the department would lose out on a substantial increase that would be negotiated by a full year omnibus uh, bill. And I believe we would have a bill that we would all be proud of and would serve the service as well. Under Secretary McCor, uh, I would like to ask you, does the department have an estimate as to how much funding would essentially be lost under a full a year CR due to cost increases and funds that would not be spent? We would estimate that the lost purchasing power is more on the order of triple the $8 billion account level only. Uh, for the reasons that you cite, the military construction, the Afghanistan, other other funds that some of the other witnesses have to have included in their testimony that that are estimated to be misaligned. It is very difficult to get a precise number because you have to go down to a program level all across the department. But at the at the uh, more general level, about triple the eight billion dollars. Thank you. Generals and Admiral, in, in some of your testimony, <clears throat> you uh, mentioned <clears throat> how this would uh, really affect modernization and our capabilities vis-a-vis -vis Russia and China, as well as our inability to reduce funding for weapon systems that you would prefer to ramp down spending on 2022. Would any of you like to take another uh, minute to either reemphasize or add to your testimony on that? This is uh, General Martin, Vice Chief Staff of the Army. I'll be happy to. Please, sir. Specifically, as it pertains to modernization, a year-long CR would delay modernization to counter Russia, China, and persistent threats and impact our industry partners and delay modernizing our industrial facilities. Uh, there's 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 second, third order effects when you talk about supply chains and everything else. But for new starts, uh, we have 71 programs that'll be affected by a year long CR. For procurement delays, we have 29. And then developmental days, procurement delays, those are equi equipment that we planned on procuring. Uh, and then developmental delays, research and development activities associated with programs, there's 32 of them. Uh, additionally, there's an impact to the Army owned industrial facilities where we had planned on modernizing our organic industrial base as part of a 15 year plan. Uh, and those activities for this year would not be able to happen and would subsequently be delayed. And so that would be deferred work. But I tell you, it's a compounding effect because, uh, Chair, we also would have to uh, next year reprioritize those projects, which means that they could potentially bump another project. So it's almost a double effect 
on the industrial base and for that matter, all those programs that I described. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who briefly would like to add something? We do have your full testimony or you can submit something for the record later. Chairman Cullen, uh, General Brown, um, we have seven, eight new, uh, new starts for the Air Force, but I would highlight, uh, particularly our nuclear portfolio, each of the uh, key aspects of uh, GBSD, LRSO, um, the B-21 uh, will uh, be delayed anywhere from a year up to 24 months. I would also add uh, our next generation air balance would uh, delay by about two years. It also impact F-35 uh, uh, by a year. And so it's uh, it has a, a compounding impact, just as uh, General Martin described. Uh, not just to us, but also when you think about what our adversary is doing and how uh, they're, they're uh, pacing out, it's important that we, uh, we stay on track. Thank you. Um, and as Mr. McCord pointed out, all these delays land up uh, making things cost more and it's an inefficient use of taxpayers' dollars. Um, I'm going to um, move on to the president's pay proposal, uh, the 2.7% uh, for all military personnel that went into effect on January 1st. The cost of the pay uh, increase across the services is more than uh, $2 billion in 2022. And the military pay raise is, an, uh, is automatically went into effect at the start of the calendar year, but under a full continuing resolution, it's not budgeted for, but for the record, um, both, uh, both both Democrats and, and Republicans on this subcommittee uh, fully support, and we have in um, in my bill uh, the, the the cost uh, uh, covered for the uh, the bill for the pay raise. Um, could you speak briefly uh, to what the military uh, pay raise by by doing that? How that's going to really impact you under a full year? Because not only some of you mentioned that they're going to get the raise, but the other things that go along with the job that they're looking forward to are going to be delayed because of the CR and how that would affect um, re recruitment and retention, which, as was pointed out by General Berger, is very important to an all-voluntary Army. Chair, let me just make a brief comment that because of this problem is pretty consistent across the services before I ask them to comment in any other detail. Exactly as you state, the the uh, by definition under a CR, the amount in the personnel accounts is flat. And so the pay raise costs have to be absorbed. The accounts themselves are, are flexible, but that doesn't mean that we have good choices within that flexibility. We're going to have to look at accessions, as have been mentioned, and, and PCS moves for our troops is probably the first and least disruptive things we could do. And then, as some of the chiefs have mentioned, there's other things that might be the next things that we'd have to do that are even more distasteful, the, the bonuses. Uh, but again, within a flat account, we have to do something uh, within, within the personnel accounts to absorb costs and, and find some other way to save money. And that's going to have to be impacting our troops in another way. Thank you. If any of you other gentlemen would like to add something, that's fine. Uh, other than that, yes? Does somebody wish to be recognized? Um, Chair McCollum, this is General Raymond. General Raymond. And one, of the, one of the biggest benefits that we realized uh, after establishing the Space Force is our ability to attract incredible talent. This talent is highly technical. It's highly educated and it's sought after, and they have other options. And if we uh, enter into this delay and have to do uh, reduce assessments and, and put hiring freezes in place to help pay for the, 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 the much um, needed and, uh, and deserved pay raise, uh, they're gonna go to other places. And that, those are people that we will not be able to get back. Uh, so to do that, we're gonna have to come up with ways as we just discussed, putting hiring freezes in place potentially. Uh, reducing assessments, cutting PCS uh, travel. It's going to impact not just the guardians, but also their families. Thank you. Thank you. And I think you um, all did a great job of, of mentioning that. With that, I am going to uh, turn it over to uh, Ranking Member Calvert with the notion that I had, I was uh, six minutes and uh, well, I'm gonna round up. I was about seven minutes. So that, that's going to be the max for, um, for the, the next three speak questionnaires. Mr. Calvert. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And for the record, uh, I'd like to say that BCA was certainly a disaster for the Department of Defense. And two, no one wants a CR. I know you don't, I don't. Uh, 
most responsible people don't. And uh, we all want to get this done by February 18th. I think that's, uh, I think that at the very latest, we need to get this done. So I'm going to emphasize again, let's strip these poison pills. Let's put the legacy riders back in and let's just talk about numbers. Higher defense number, uh, lower non-defense discretionary account. Let me define pay raise as we talk about that. Obviously, the pay raise that, we, that we're anticipating uh, is really a down payment on inflation because let's, uh, let's, let's face it, we're not keeping pace with inflation with a 7% inflation rate and rising. Uh, we may end up with 8 to 10% inflation in the, next, uh, in the next year, according to some economists. Uh, so let me get to what's happening to uh, to our defense spending. It's no secret. Uh, this hearing is is uh, obviously on an unclassified level. It's uh, broadcast on the internet. There's no doubt that uh, our enemies are watching at the present time. Uh, while we are frozen, unable to properly uh, provide for our nation's defense, our adversaries are planning to react accordingly. Uh, Admiral Gilday, please give this committee your assessment of probable Chinese activity regarding Taiwan over the next year, and what an invasion of the island would mean for the for America and its allies. Uh, Ranking Member Calvert, thank you. So at a, I, I mentioned up front my comments that uh, what the CR does, what the CR yields for the nation is a smaller, less ready, less capable, uh, less lethal Navy. We need to be forward to matter. We need to be in the way to matter. That means we need to be in the Western Pacific. Uh, and we need to be there in numbers. And so being able to sustain the numbers that the Indo-PACOM commander needs on a day-to-day -day basis of both Navy and Marine forces, uh, as well as the other services, is going to be challenged by cuts to our operation operations and, and maintenance accounts. I'd also say that there's some risk there when we talk about, for example, one of the chiefs talked about uh, uh, cuts to flying hours. With that, usually comes an increase in, in mishap rate. So the less you train, the, the, the more likely you are uh, to make mistakes. And so there's a, uh, a compounding problems here that we're gonna have to deal with. But I think, um, you know, I also talked about the fact that this makes us uh, a less credible, pre presents a less credible deterrent to any type of opportunistic uh, behavior by Russia and China. And it's not just China uh, in the South China Sea and the Taiwan Strait, uh, but we just have to, look uh, east right now to what's going on on the Russia, uh, Russia uh, Ukrainian border uh, and the potential for uh, for significant activity there as well. Yeah, I was uh, glad you brought that up, Admiral. I, I was going to ask General Martin to give the committee his assessment on probable Russian activity regarding the Ukraine over uh, the next few months and what further invasion into the country would mean, again, for America and its allies, especially the first ground war since the end of World War II. Congressman, uh, thank you. Uh, what I'll tell you is uh, we're in the business of making sure that never happens. And so to do that, we need predictable, adequate, timely, and sustained funding uh, over time. Uh, and in order to do that, we've got to have soldiers who are ready today for tomorrow's challenges. Uh, who knew that we would be conducting the NEO operation out of Afghanistan last year? Who knew that we'd be in Ethiopia this year? Who knew we'd be doing Operation Allies Welcome? Those are all expressions of the Army's ability to provide ready forces to, to respond to things that happen in the world. Uh, as it pertains to securing this nation's interests, we need a ready Army. And so we need that consistent, predictable funding in order to be able to do that. For our readiness accounts, uh, we've asked for more money in 22 in many of the sub-activity groups that we did uh, in, in 21. We won't be able to, to use that money to do that. And so our units, as we speak in month four of a 12-year uh, budget, are, are, are executing their training, but it's not at the level that we planned on doing because we don't have all the funding that we should have gotten with the 22 budget. So even right now, if we stop the CR today, there's been a four month impact in the United States Army. There's also uh, the, 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 the supply chain that provides parts to our forces that's impacted by this because they expected to execute so, many, uh, so much uh, operational activity this year. And with that decrease, there's an impact on our ability to, to forecast sales within the working capital fund and make contracts between that entity and contractors and suppliers across this country. And so it's a huge impact when we can't predict accurately 
exactly how much money we're going to have and we change what we're planning to do because we're all about building readiness in the United States Army Congressman. Thank you. Uh, and lastly, uh, General Brown uh, is a uh, patent famously referred to uh, Rummel. I, I read the book and I read uh, in the process of reading your book, Accelerate, Change or Lose. Uh, we're clearly not accelerating. So what's at stake and how are our adversaries are taking advantage of our inability to adapt to the current threat environment, especially in space? Well, I'll, I'll actually probably have to defer to General Raymond on space, but I'll just tell you from, from the Air Force perspective, the thing I, I do think about uh, 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 Ranking Member Calvert is the aspect of how our adversaries are increasing their capability that puts us at a disadvantage. And, and by uh, slowing down our pace of, uh, uh, of acquiring capability, maintaining our readiness, taking care of airmen and families has an impact to be able to uh, be able to deter so we don't get in the situation that General Martin just uh, described. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Russia and Ukraine. Uh, I'll just, if you don't mind, I'll turn to uh, General Raymond on space. On, on the space capability, so we're, we remain the best in the world in space. We've got incredible, exquisite capabilities, but they were built for a different domain. They were built for a benign domain without a threat. The domain that we see today is is threatened from a full full spectrum of threats. Everything from reversible jamming to kinetic destruction is demonstrated by Russia. Uh, we have to modernize. We have to make that shift, and we are losing time. Uh, that's why this. Uh, not having a CR is so critical to us. We have to move out and modernize to a more resilient, defendable architecture that can meet the demands of a contested domain. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Okay. Thank and you. Go back. You and I were, were right, right in the sweet spot with the same amount of time. So now okay. I will turn to um, uh, full, uh, full chair uh, of the Appropriations Committee, Ms. DeLauro. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I wanted to make a, a comment first before uh, my questions. Um, the debate over riders is going to occur. And uh, as far as I know about negotiating, an ultimatum is not, in, is not negotiating. Uh, as has had been in the, past, uh, in the past, there will be a very robust uh, debate uh, around uh, policy issues uh, and riders. And you know, the fact is I may not get everything that I want and you may not get everything that you want, uh, but that is about a negotiation. And that means that you need to come to the table uh, to have that conversation. And as I said, to date, there has not been a single piece of paper outlining what it is um, that our colleagues on the other side of the aisle uh, would, would like. Um, uh, there has to be a discussion, especially uh, and, and looking at why would we jeopardize our national security? There's already been a four month delay and as has been described, causing serious consequences and our adversaries gaining an advantage. And, and with that, let me ask those who have not um, really uh, addressed the issue of the importance of recruiting and retraining. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and in order to recruit and to retain the best fighting force, um, uh, we, when we talk about military red, uh, readiness and each of the services faces a unique challenge on the military personnel side, whether you got a pilot shortage or appropriately manning ships. So um, how would, and I wanna ask those who have not answered this question, how would a full year CR impact the services, your services ability to recruit and to retain the force you need to meet the challenges that our nation is facing? And you've done, you've done a good job of being respectful of one another, so who would ever like to go first? That's right. Don't be shy. <laughs> uh, Ma'am, uh, this is General Berger. Yes. I, I think probably for us, the, no different than the other services. If you have a fixed bank account and you, you have the force that you have, and inflation has gone up and you have a pay raise, then you're going to slow down recruiting. And what does that mean? That means that the recruiter in, in Iowa or Colorado or Pennsylvania is going to have to tell the people that they're working with, I can't bring you on to, I can't bring you on to active duty. I can't recruit you now. Can you please wait uh, eight, 10, 12 months, and then we can bring you on. And as my peers uh, mentioned, of course, they can't wait. They're going, they need jobs. They're going to go look for work elsewhere. So the very, the, the war for talent, the, the, the that, uh, that is the war, that is the world today. Uh, they, they're not going to wait, just as General Raymond said. Well, I think the recruiter at the recruiter level, at the bottom level, 
they're going to try to hold on to their pool and tell them to wait, wait, wait. And those, those, uh, the, the high school graduates, the college graduates are not going to be able to wait. So a year from now, in other words, when, when we do have appropriations and we can't afford to start recruiting in, in the numbers we need, the quality won't be there. So the recruiters will have to look in a different direction to, to fill the ranks, the holes that we have. Retention, I think, will be the same way. If we have to go the route of bonuses, if we start to affect retention, then the same war for talent exists for those who have six, seven, ten years of experience. They'll leave. They'll leave because they have to support their families and they need some confidence that their, their employer uh, has, has their back and, ha and is going to uh, compete in that market. If that's not the case, they'll leave. And I'll turn it over to my uh, other peers. Man, this is Admiral Gilday. Um, if I could just also tie together accessions and, uh, and, uh, and, and retention real quick. As uh, Secretary McCord mentioned, the way we're going to pay for that 2.7% pay raise is through uh, cutting accessions, uh, cutting uh, uh, reenlistment bonuses, uh, incentive bonuses, and also by reducing uh, permanent change of station moves. So for the Navy, we've got about 145,000 sailors at sea. Over the past year, a year ago, we had 10,000 of those, uh, those billets that were gapped. We've been able to cut that down by, uh, by more than half. So about 3% of our billets at sea right now are gapped, and we adjust to make up for that. If we cut our accessions by 75%, that, that's 23,000 sailors. We are, again, going to exacerbate that gap at sea in a place where we need it least. At the same time, we're trying to entice sailors, our best sailors, to stay in the Navy, but we're cutting those and their families. We're not just retaining sailors. We're retaining families. Uh, we're going to have to cut reenlistment bonuses, incentive bonuses to keep the best in. So that's also going to exacerbate uh, that those gaps at sea, again, where we need those people the most at the tip of the spear. Uh, and then uh, with respect to PCS moves, um, so we're going to reduce those by, we think, around 37,000, which is about half of our moves for next year. Those are families, as the commandant uh, uh, so eloquently articulated earlier in his comments, there are people that have already taken jobs, spouses that are already uh, planned on uh, taking jobs, school plans that have been made uh, that are going to have to be uh, that are going to have to be curtailed, and then uh, we again risk breaking faith with our sailors and their families. Thanks for the opportunity, Madam. Chair, may I say a couple things too? Please, yes, thank you, Jim. Uh, so I agree with everything that uh, General Berger and Admiral Gilday said. Uh, these are measures that we may have to do in the United States Army, uh, but I can tell you that there's a couple things I know for sure that are going to happen as a result of this. And once again, we've got eight months left in the year. We've got to we got to watch things very closely, prioritize. Uh, but God forbid if we have to do it. But so we're gonna we're gonna bring in a full cohort of uh, our second lieutenants out of ROTC and West Point. But as it pertains to ROTC about 25% of them are not going to start their initial entry training as officers until the beginning of the fiscal year because we won't have enough mitts of funding. This is funding used to travel to professional military education uh, available. Uh, additionally, uh, a 10 point, one of those sub-activity groups I talked about with the misaligned OMA resources uh, is one that pertains to uh, funding basic training. And so we've got a $10.2 million uh, reduction uh, that's going to lead to a degradation of the quality of our basic training. And we see that as significant because how important initial answer training is. Uh, but those are the two additions I wanted to make to the previous statements from my other fellow colleagues. Thank you. And uh, Chair Durrell, I'll, I'll just make one additional comment. And I think the thing that the, we, we talked about some of the near-term impacts, but uh, when we, for the Air Force, it'll be about 50% of our sessions. But what you'll see that it's not just the near-term, it's a long-term, because you will have a bathtub of airmen that will not be here throughout a 20-year career. And that's something we got to pay attention to as well anytime we have uh, uh, these types of delays in the sessions. Thank you. Is there anyone that we missed in terms of uh, asking that, answering that question? If not, thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back.
I'm looking at the layout here to see if maybe she's just muted here. Um, she, Ms. Granger, it's your time for questions. We cannot hear you, however. Okay, we're fixing that. It's good now. Mm -hmm. You magically fixed it. Uh, one sure. thing I want to start out with, it says, um, I think there's a misunderstanding about where we've been. Uh, we are not saying we want a continuing resolution. We're saying, how do we get this done? Uh, but it's, it concerns me, we gave you an offer. Uh, just because you didn't like the offer, it doesn't mean that we didn't give an offer. And we did, and then it's just stopped. And so a way forward is to get back together and say, all right, how do we work this out? Um, but I, I am concerned that there's uh, a misunderstanding about uh, about the offer that we had and the way forward. And then you can answer your question. Mm -hmm. You could ask a question. I, Madam Chair, in uh, fact, there has not been an offer. So I have to correct the record. No, there's not been an offer of money on the table. No. That's correct. Ms. Granger, there, do you have no a question? Offer. Yeah, just go ahead and ask your question. Okay. Uh, my first question, every member of this subcommittee is greatly concerned about China's rapid military modernization. Could each of the services share how long-term CR would inhibit Mm -hmm. our ability to compete with adversaries like China. Okay. Are they still available? They're yeah. still available. I, uh, I haven't been calling on them. They've been kind of uh, volunteering on their own. Uh, uh -huh. someone, I, I'm, a, I'm a former substitute high school teacher. I can start calling on you gentlemen. If, uh, or Ms. I'll go first. Uh, Chair, if you'd like. Certainly, good to, sure. see, good to see you, Mr. Martin. Okay, as, as, as it pertains to China, it's the same as Russia, it's the same for any adversary that's threatening the security of this nation. Uh, uh, Long-term CR will impact our, reality, our ability to provide ready forces today, make sure that we can take care of our soldiers and their family members and our civilians and the infrastructure and the ecosystem that surrounds them uh, it'll impact our ability to modernize uh, for the Army. It's 71 new start programs, 29 procurement delays, uh, 32 developmental delays, Perfect. and several items in the organic industrial base that we will not be able to modernize. We, it, it impacts our ability to compete today and compete tomorrow. And so uh, a long-term CR has a significant impact on the United States Army. Thank you. Portion. Thank you. Ranking Member uh, Granger, General Brown from uh, the, the Air Force. I, I would highlight that, you know, when I think about particularly the PRC and what we've seen them do over the course of the past uh, several months in relation to their nuclear portfolio, this has an impact of uh, year long CR had impacts our nuclear portfolio uh, by delaying GBSD by a year, uh, plus or oh, by 18 to 24 months, uh, the moder uh, B21 by about a year, and the modernization on the B52 by a year as well. I'd also add to that the uh, BF, it'll slow down the F-35 uh, by about a year, which will be uh, very important to any type of deterrence and or uh, capability. Uh, I would say the same thing with NGAD, it would delay it for at least two years. And so what you see is a, a series of capabilities that would actually provide us uh, to provide us the advantage, ensure we maintain par at least uh, you know advantage, if not parity, in certain key war fighting capabilities and concepts in a year long CR actually allows our adversary just to continue their acceleration while we are, uh, I would say, stuck in neutral. Thank you. I, I would, uh, this is General Raymond from the Space Force. I would add, as it relates to China, uh, China has gone from zero to 60 in space. They are moving at incredible speeds and doing two things. One, building space capabilities for their own use to have that same advantage that we currently enjoy. And two, developing capabilities to deny us our access. As I mentioned in my opening comment, we we view our ability to provide space capabilities and the advantage that they provide to our joint uh, uh, forces a sacred duty. And you can't take that for granted anymore. The continuing resolution is going to in, uh, impact our ability to modernize our forces to be to be there in the face of a growing threat. Will reduce our readiness and will will hinder long term impacts to our guardians and their families. Thank you. Anyone else? 
Question to comment? Uh, just perhaps one or two things, building on uh, what my peers have stated. Not turn this um, we're going to treat. We're going to treat it like you, like probably a surgeon would treat a patient. In other words, triage. You have to put the forces forward that they can handle a crisis uh, of the moment. You're going to take risk in uh, areas that this budget, uh, the increase of research and development, things like that. That you need. Uh, your peers are going to your peers are going to go ahead. The competition is going to make that investment. You're not. So in re in terms of a relative pace, they're going to move forward quickly because they're stealing our technology plus you're investing fully in research and development will be it will be at flat uh, and we cannot make that up that research and development time loss you can't make that up with money a year from now that's time loss cannot catch up because the laboratories research and development you just can't accelerate it but so much I think we we approach it like you would a patient we'll have the the, the least ready when the nation uh, the most ready when the nation is least ready we'll put that forward We'll hold the door best we can, uh, and we'll fall farther behind in areas where we should be at least at parity and should be and actually should be in front. That's where we'll pay a price. We can't. We will not be able to catch up. Man, this is Admiral Gilday. Uh, adding on to to, uh, to the, what the other chief said, they're they're accelerating. We are decelerating, right? So in areas where we wanna we wanna close on known gaps with with China, as an example. Hypersonics would be a really good example of that, right? The Army wants to field the system in, uh, in 23. The Navy wants to follow along with that same system, shipboard based in 25. We are going to slow that program down if we can't move money around uh, to keep it alive. Uh, another area, um, uh, another area where we want to, where we have overmatch right now, and we want to maintain that overmatch would be in the undersea. Right, and so we want to keep on building submarines, and the submarines that we have, we want to be able to continue to maintain them to sustain them. So, uh, uh, based on the year-long CR, we will delay doing maintenance on 10% of our submarine force. That's five submarines. We're not going to do maintenance on them. We're going to move it. We're going to push that down the road. We know what the cost has been to that in the past, and we're going to do it again. We're going to do the same thing with two aircraft carriers. We need those carriers in the water, and we need them forward, and we get them fully maintained. But we're going to stop that. In areas where we have gaps, we're trying to catch up. Another good example would be weapons with range and speed. That's where we're putting money. But we're going to slow that down in important areas where those gaps are going to be exacerbated as the Chinese continue, as uh, General Berger said, to do their R&D and increase their production lines. And I'll pause there. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, next, we have up uh, Mr. Ryan. Mr. Rogers, Mr. Cuellar, and Mr. Cole. Mr. Ryan, and the five Thank minutes clock will start. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the opportunity. Just uh, a quick comment. You know, all the discussions around the budget and the appropriations and the, the, in the context of us trying to compete and out-compete China, I, to me, it's very, very clear that these conversations we're having around defense, technology, are critically important, but there's no way you outcompete China when our kids are, are going to McDonald's to download their homework because uh, they don't have access to, to quality uh, internet. There's no way we're going to be able to outcompete them if they're producing 600,000 uh, STEM graduates a year and we're producing 60. And that's why the investments that, that we're trying to make here are critical for us to be able to outcompete them. And you're just not gonna outcompete China by cutting taxes for the top 1% and hoping that somehow, some way, uh, we're gonna have 330 million people, healthy, educated, skilled, and uh, innovative to, to take them on. It's just not gonna happen. We've tried it for 30 or 40 years. So uh, to me, this gotta be a whole of government approach. Uh, and I think it's important for us to keep that in mind. Um, I've got a couple uh, questions that are uh, local to Ohio um, that I would love to uh, get answers to. Um, one of them is the procurement of additional M1A2 SEP V3 systems. Uh, the M1 Abrams uh, tank provides the lethality and sophistication necessary to counter Russia and the Chinese Communist Party. Their third generation platforms enhance readiness to our military while providing economic stability to the state of Ohio. And the Joint Systems Manufacturing Center 
in Lima, Ohio, provides nearly 1,000 jobs within the local community, generates millions of dollars in economic growth, and involves over 700 different Ohio-based suppliers in the manufacturing process. And the provisions of the FY 2022 defense bill would procure 70 additional uh, tanks and variants and strengthen our ability to counter near peer adversaries. So this is a critical thing uh, that I'm really worried about with the CR. Uh, so I would like to ask uh, General Martin, what role does this funding instability and unpredictability uh, play in your resourcing decisions on programs like the Abrams upgrade? What are the strategic implications of delaying manufacturing uh, as a result of the CR? And additionally, I know Poland announced plans for uh, FMS procurement of 250 tanks to counter Russia aggression within the region. Can you provide an update to the status of that request? Thank you, Mr. Thank you for the question, Congressman. Uh, what I can tell you, comparing uh, 21 and 22, there will be no significant impact to our plan to produce the Abrams uh, SEP B3 vehicles, uh, A2 SEP B3 vehicles. Uh, at JSMC. Uh, I can also tell you that we, we are not anticipating any CR related impact to the workforce. Uh, there is an impact that I'd like to discuss that I think is worthy of uh, your, your awareness. And that is uh, we had two uh, organic industry based uh, improvement projects planned for uh, 22 that would start in 22. They're new starts. And so they'll have to be delayed by a year and then compete against other demands across the board. Uh, but it was to uh, modernize some of the infrastructure to support not only tank, but also striker production, but also uh, to improve the, uh, the heating and cooling system, the HVAC system. So those will have to be delayed. Uh, as it pertains to Poland, we're in the process of talking to Poland uh, and we're looking how we can best meet their needs. Thank you, Congressman. I'm sorry, you're breaking up there, General. Can you, what was that you said at the end about Poland? We're in the process and we're considering, we're, we're, we're discussing this with them. We're considering the best way to meet their needs. That's where we're at right now, Congressman. Okay. Thank you. Uh, a couple questions uh, of just kind of that are very local in nature at the Youngstown Air Reserve Station for our uh, friends in the, in the Air Force. Um, we had $8.7 million to expand the Air Reserve Station Assault Strip, which provides infrastructure to support C-17 and C-130 aircraft, which is critical to maintaining readiness. As you know, how would the CR impact the viability of the air station and its operational capabilities should the infrastructure uh, project be delayed further? And then also uh, the issue with the uh, C-130J platform integration uh, we've been talking about this uh, for years, and as you know, the C-130J platform provides additive capabilities, enhancing the system's aerial capabilities in support of its global mission. Uh, the 21 defense bill provided two C-130J platforms uh, for YARS, and the 22 bill would secure four additional platforms. How does any further delay in the procurement of C-130J aircraft affect the specialized mission uh, of the 910th airlift wing and their aerial spray mission and the longevity of yours is a combat multiplier. Sir, you have about a minute to answer that great question from um, Mr. Ryan. Sure. On the assault runway project, um, it does impact the uh, training for not just for Youngstown, but really uh, for a number of, uh, of uh, training units around the Northeast. Uh, the challenge there is that uh, we won't let gain that savings as far as uh, fuel and time distance uh, for training at the same time it, with increased construction costs it'll be an issue it'll just be more expensive in the long run uh, on the second uh, question here um, with the continued resolution what happens then is we do not have enough c-130s to actually start another basing action to uh, whether it's there at Youngstown uh, with the great mission they do or any place else just based on a CR not having enough c-130s to actually start a basing action uh, uh, going forward thank okay. you Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Certainly. Uh, Mr. Mr. Rogers, you are now recognized. And after Mr. Rogers, it will be Mr. Cuera, Mr. Cole, and then Ms. Bustos. Mr. Rogers, you're recognized uh, as the former chair of this uh, subcommittee. 
Well, I thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thanks for uh, holding the hearing. Let me uh, apologize to the uh, witnesses who this hearing required them to spend valuable hours uh, doing research that we all know what the answer is. I mean, as appropriators, especially members of this defense subcommittee, uh, we know that CR is not good for the military. Exhibit A. Comes as no surprise that their, their testimony will say that CRs uh, are not good for the country. Bad for our service members, they're bad for our readiness for research, development, for the procurement of new systems, for our industrial base, and everything in between. CRs hurt our national security. We all know that. So why have a hearing on something that we all know is should be admitted? So this, this hearing was called to score political points, try to bring pressure uh, on the Republican side of the aisle that this would harm the military. Well, surely it does, but it's the Democrats who are in charge and causing it, including taking all this valuable time from very important people to tell us what we already know. It's surprising and honestly, it's disappointing. So I apologize that all of you in the Pentagon are being used as pawns in these uh, budget negotiations. And I can certainly think of better uses of your time and hours. So thank you for all your lifetimes of service. Rest assured that we share the same goal of preventing another CR. Let's be clear, Madam Chair, that the framework for success in this business we're in has always been no poison pills in these pills and restore legacy riders. I've been at this a long time, so let's not have any revisionist history. This is what we've always done. You're not doing so far on this bill. This is about decreasing domestic spending and increasing defense spending. So Madam Chair, that's all I have and I yield back. Thank you. And you know how much um, I, I do respect you, but this was not um, my effort to uh, take political shots. Uh, this was my effort to quash those uh, who are, are talking about year-long CRs. No one, no one on the, on the Appropriations Committee is, yet you see things in the news, and unfortunately, sir, it's usually from your side of the aisle. And I'll quote again, um, and it's a December 1st quote, and I can get you the gentleman, uh, the person who said it. Republicans should be in favor of a CR until Biden is out of office, so they're not even talking about a one-year CR. That would be uh, the proper Republican thing to do, and anybody saying otherwise is deeply foolish. I know you and I, sir, do not agree with that sentiment, and my my uh, my goal here is to educate other members who don't understand the appropriations process as well as you and I, and many other of our colleagues that we serve alongside with. So I, 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 I understand your frustration, uh, but I want to I, I want to be clear what my my intent was, and I wanted that on the record. Mr. Cuellar. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, to all our witnesses. Thank you for being here with y'all. Uh, you know, when you look at, we don't like CRs. We don't want to see a CR. We want to make sure that we, as appropriators, I think both uh, sides want to make sure that we do our work and, and, and add the money. But the military has operated under CRs in the past, uh, short-term CRs, but it's operator CRs. Are there any strategies that any of the services uh, uh, plans to um, implement to minimize the effects of the CRs um, uh, on our ability to maintain the readiness of our troops? In other words, we've learned some lessons 
we don't want to see another CR. I, I think none of us here want to see another CR. Definitely not a long, uh, year-long CR. But are there any lessons learned uh, that we uh, have taken from past CRs? Congressman, let me just uh, open with saying we have, as, as a number of members have, have stated, uh, we have a lot of experience, sadly, now with CR, so we certainly have some lessons learned. But um, in general, there's no strategy. There's no strategy to combat math, right? If you don't have enough money, you can't you can't operate the way you need to. You can't pay you can't pay the troops more pay raise with the same amount of money and not have an impact come out some other way. So yes, we we have adapted on the contracting side. And we're thinking about prioritization. You've heard some of the chiefs mention, I would probably have to do A and do B and do C. But again, this is fundamentally a math problem. Okay. Uh, let me ask this uh, question. So we're looking at the CR from our perspective, a uh, high level perspective. Uh, tell me from your experience or, and this applies to General Martin or anybody, um, tell me how that affects uh, an enlisted person on a day-to-day -day basis under a CR. Congressman, thank you. Uh, so let's talk about someone that's at uh, Fort Bliss, Texas, and they had planned to execute multi-echelon training uh, and were un unable to execute multi-echelon training uh, because the resources were not there. We had to we had to take the training and we had to take it a level or two down from where it was. So where they were going to gain a certain amount of proficiency proficiency doing their military occupational specialty under the 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 the, the conditions of a multi echelon training environment, they're not going to have that opportunity to do that. In the Army, we're not going to turn off CTC uh, combat training center rotations uh, because of the CR. But we're going to have to take a hard look at what multi-echelon training we're doing at home station, places where we build readiness each and every day. And of course, as it pertains to that soldier, take that soldier 18 months from now, because of the impact of the metered funding and the less than anticipated funding going into our supply chains, there's going to be an impact on our ability to provide that soldier a part on its vehicle 18 months from now that we would have been able to today if we had predictable funding because of the lagged effect it'll have on the industry base and its ability to produce those parts for our soldiers of the future. Uh, General, thank you so much. Uh, I, I appreciate that uh, that impact on the enlisted soldier down there, whether it's Fort Bliss or um, uh, Joint Base San Antonio, or wherever it might be. Or, somewhere close to Carter, John Carter's area, uh, Fort Hood also. Uh, let me, uh, before I close, because I got about a uh, little bit over a minute. Um, you know, I lost one of my uh, constituents, uh, Lance Corporal David Lee Espinosa in Afghanistan, you know, part of the 13 soldiers that got killed at the very end. Um, the FY appropriations had uh, certain funds toward Afghanistan. Uh, operations, and maybe you all have answered this, but uh, if you don't mind repeating this again, uh, what are those funds going to be used now? Uh, how, what are the reprogramming of those funds? Uh, what are the priorities that we're looking at if there's a CR, year-long CR? Congressman, the funding to support the Afghan military, the so-called ASFF training, those funds are basically not usable now because there is no, there is no, you know, Afghan forces that meet the legal standards. So that money would basically be something that if your committee writes a full year bill, I would anticipate you would you would take all that money and redistribute it to other needs. But we are unable to do that for you or with you under a CR. Uh, of course, there are reductions in, in other areas uh, because we have less presence ourselves within the Army's account in particular. But those things focused specifically on Afghanistan are just uh, that money is sort of sitting there frozen and not usable because it's we don't have enough transfer authority to move all of that to other needs. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Thank you to the witnesses. Thank you. We're going to have Mr. Cole go next after him, Ms. Bustos, Mr. Romack, and then Ms. Kilpatrick. Um, I recognize uh, my friend, the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Cole. Thanks very much, Madam Chair. And uh, I want to begin by associating myself with the comments of uh, Ranking Member Granger and Ranking Member uh, Calvert. 
uh, in terms of their concerns. I think uh, Representative Calvert put it pretty well when he said, look, the outline of the deal here is pretty obvious. The defense number's got to go up. The domestic number's got to come down to some degree. The bill's got to go out. Hyde has to go back in. And I think we all uh, know that. And I want to commend the chairwoman of the full committee uh, because nobody's worked harder to try and get everybody around the table than our chairwoman. Uh, and nobody's been more aggressive about trying to be tough on date lines than our chairwoman, you know, trying to restrict the time, trying to make sure that we got this done in a timely fashion so that the, the folks at the Pentagon and every other agency of government could plan and use the, the resources we give them wisely. So um, I've got very little criticism for this subcommittee, none for the subcommittee, frankly, very little for our, our full committee. I will say this as a suggestion before I get to my my question, just well may be beyond us, Madam Chair. We may need, number one, the leadership of both parties to sit down and get engaged in both the House and the Senate. I know they've got a lot of different responsibilities, but I think their big one is funding the government. And I would say the same thing with all due respect, and I mean this respectfully for the president, the administration. Uh, the president uh, has been a pretty busy guy. He got some things done, uh, you know, a COVID relief bill, a infrastructure bill. He's working on things now. He's not having as much success on, you know, changing the filibuster, voting legislation, build back better bill. Maybe he needs to focus on funding the government that he heads. Uh, and uh, maybe we need a White House uh, convention here because we're not going to get some of these decisions transcend this committee. This subcommittee has very little to do with Hyde, uh, you know, but Hyde certainly is going to impact our ability to get our job done. So we're going to have to get some people above our level engaged in, in the process. And the president, at the end of the day, is the commander in chief, is responsible for the military. Uh, and we need some focus here, uh, not on some of these other agendas that frankly are stalling out right now. Now, in terms of this specific hearing, let me ask a couple of questions. I want to go first to uh, General Brown, if I may. I'm fortunate enough to have Tinker Air Force Base in my district, and I know how important logistics are and just the maintenance of what you have. So I would like to ask you what a CR would do. Number one, we're expanding capabilities down there for the KC-46 and for other potential missions looking ahead that we might pick up. Uh, and then uh, number two, just the day-to-day -day maintenance of uh, what's frankly an aging air fleet, uh, you know, what will the CR do in terms of your ability to take care of those kinds of problems? Uh, thank you, Representative Colt. And, and you know, specifically, I mean, very broadly, the, uh, the CR will have a number of challenges for a number of our depots and really our weapon system sustainment uh, accounts which will be impacted. When you think of really about Tinker, one of the things that when I had a chance to visit there was the uh, site for the uh, KC-46, uh, uh, aspects for the depot that it will be one of those that would not get done if we had a long year long CR and that would get delayed and which would impact our uh, being able to sustain that particular platform. I think the other aspect when you look at WSS and our depots, um, when, when you have this aging fleet that, that we do have, it does also impact the workforce. And if you don't have the funding there to uh, balance that workforce to actually go against the, uh, the, the uh, platforms or we're trying to work through. In addition to the parts and the spares and the supply chain, all those things kind of come together that have an impact. And then uh, the the other part of it, uh, CR also offered the the investment not only uh, in, with the Air Force but also with our industry partners and the small businesses and uh, vendors that act, help support us. Uh, they uh, they don't have a predictable funding flow, and so you don't bring on the workforce, you don't bring on the parts, and it just slows everything down for us. It'll have a huge impact on our readiness across the Air Force, and then a lot of that will end up doing on the backs of our airmen. And uh, we don't want that, and then, then it becomes a retention issue. So it just there's compounding uh, impacts with, with the year-long CR. Uh, thank you. Appreciate that very much, Madam Chair. I may be out of time. If not, I have a quick question for uh, um, for General Martin, which he partly covered earlier. But I also go for it. <laughs> okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Also privileged to have uh, Fort Sill in my district, and a couple of the modernization missions that have been laid out by the Army or our base there. And uh, General Martin, uh, from a modernization standpoint, I know we are in a very serious contest with near peer adversaries. What would uh, a CR do in, in terms of setting back your efforts to have the force ready to deal with, uh, God forbid, uh, you know, the kinds of uh, uh, adversaries that have, we haven't fought in a long time, that have armor, that have air forces, that have comparable technical capabilities to uh, what the United States military has? 
Congressman, it's good seeing you again, and uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I'll just I'll try to put this uh, as, as as simply as I could. You know, our chief of staff of the Army, General McConville, stated previously that uh, we've got 24 of our 31 plus four signature programs are going to be in some form or fashion in the hands of soldiers, whether it's in an operational testing environment, a soldier touch point, or actually feeling it. 24 of those programs will be out there by 2023. Well, without the funding that would be associated with the restraints of the CR, 19 of those 24 programs will be impacted. The timing of those programs will be impacted. So that's a huge impact. And once again, as my colleagues have all said so aptly, uh, you can't get back time, but it's also the resources that we could have spent this year, we're going to have to spend next year, which means it's twice the cost. And so uh, it's a huge impact on our modernization and uh, maintaining our ability to compete in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Bustos, Mr. Walmack, then Ms. Kirkpatrick and Mr. Carter, and I have to step out for a minute so Mr. Cuellar has a gavel. Ms. Right. Bustos. Thank yes, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, and also wanna thank you and, and the ranking member for having this uh, hearing today. I wanna thank our witnesses as well for your service and your, your leadership and, and certainly during these uncertain times. Um, obviously, I, whether we're Democrats or Republicans, uh, we can all agree that national security is critical to all of us and uh, funding the Department of Defense reliably and on, and on time is something that I think we all uh, know is desirable. Um, I'm, let me start, if I could please, with uh, General Martin. Um, I'd like to ask you a question about the modernization efforts at the Army. Um, in the congressional district that I serve in Illinois, uh, we are home to the Rock Island Arsenal. And as you know, that sits on an island in the middle of the Mississippi River between the states of Iowa and Illinois. Um, and the arsenal is home to the Army's Center of Excellence for Additive and Advanced Manufacturing. Um, and right now, the, the Center of Excellence is working on really just some amazing new research uh, into the next generation combat vehicle. And it will soon be home to the world's largest metal 3D printer that is actually being manufactured in the northern part of our congressional district out of Rockford. So that will go from Rockford being manufactured and then come down to the Quad Cities. Uh, but this program is critical to the future of the arsenal and uh, we believe also to the future of the Army. Uh, so, so General Martin, if you um, could share your thoughts about how a year long continuing resolution would impact major acquisitions and research programs within the Army, and if any thoughts that you have specific to the Rock Island Arsenal as well. Congresswoman, I am not tracking any direct impacts to Rock Island Arsenal, but what I'll tell you is it's a great example of the, the need and our executing a long-term organic industrial base modernization program so that we can meet the needs of the future. Uh, that being said, uh, there are other organic industrial base uh, modernization efforts that we are, are, are planning on doing this year, but won't be able to do it uh, because we won't be able to use this, the, the, the 22 funds for uh, a new start. But across the modernization programs for the Army, new start, 71 programs affected. Where Rock Island Arsenal indirectly supports those programs uh, i don't know but i'll bet there's an impact i don't want to speculate though procurement delays 29 and developmental delays research and development activities 32 programs delayed so there's a huge impact across the army there and uh arsenals like the rock island arsenal are a key component to our holistic organic industrial base not only for today's needs, but also for the future. So it's very important that we continue to modernize them. And we don't wanna wait till next year to do that what we plan to do this year. Thank you. Thank you, General Martin, I, I appreciate that. Uh, just one more question and I'll, I'll be brief here, but uh, General Brown, it's, it's great to see you even though it's virtual. Um, it, we so appreciated out of Peoria, Illinois that you came to the 182nd airlift wing uh, this past summer and uh, we always welcome you back. Um, and I know that uh, Congressman Ryan already talked with you a little bit about the C-130s. Um, I'm, um, you know, let, let's, uh, if, if you could drill maybe a little bit deeper on that. Um, obviously, 
um, as, as we have this discussion about a year long CR and how that would affect Air Force acquisition and modernization efforts. Um, you know, for, for the national, for the Air National Guard, um, you know, we've talked about uh, providing upgraded technologies for the C-130Hs, uh, like the ones that are flown at Peoria, but any additional thoughts, uh, General Brown, especially specific to uh, Peoria, Illinois? Well, when I, when I tell you, it's not just for Peoria and the work that they do, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to go visit, but it's when you look at across the guard, um, because of the funding and the way that we'll have to dip into our uh, some of our other accounts, then it will curtail some of their training. So, you know, just for their day-to-day -day readiness as a as a uh, as a C-130 unit, that will be impacted. And then there's also the individual training, so the professional development for those particular airmen that will continue to build up on their skill sets. That will also be impacting. I, I would also tell you that's a ripple effect. So if you have, you know, you don't get the full training when you deserve it. And you're supposed to be training someone behind you, then it just kind of, uh, you know, it kind of slides downhill and it becomes a little bit of a slippery slope that we have to dig ourselves out of. And so I, I have a concern not just about Peoria, but I, I really look across, you know, the guard as, as a whole, the impact of curtailing uh, or counseling uh, training. And you may miss those opportunities for those airmen. It, it's tough to make up because you don't get that time back. And so it's important that, uh, and, you know, we want to, we want quality airmen. We want to make sure they have quality equipment to work with. And, and uh, that's why it's important not to have a year long CR. Thank you. Right. Very good. Thank you so much, uh, General Brown and uh, Chairwoman McCollum. I, I'll yield back. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Cuero, thank you for being there. Um, Mr. Romack, then Ms. Kilpatrick and Mr. Carter. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And, and my thanks uh, to the witnesses that are here today. I'm going to be uh, very brief. Um, and first of all, I'd apologize to all of the witnesses today that we're now two hours into this um, into this hearing, and uh, I think we could have uh, saved a lot of time on the part of these very busy gentlemen uh, and ourselves, for that matter, uh, by just uh, being honest with ourselves and recognizing that uh, a, a year-long CR is bad. Uh, and you can define bad a lot of ways, and we've seen and heard a lot of those definitions of what bad looks like. It's just bad. Uh, but not only is it bad, it is embarrassing. It is embarrassing that we, the adults in the room here on the Appropriations Committee, uh, cannot get out of our own way. A uh, couple of data points. One, we didn't get the president's budget until May 28th. And now that's not uh, a dig on President Biden. Uh, it's a new administration. I realize it takes some time. But we got the budget on May 28th. Uh, and the budget was for $753 billion, there, thereabouts, uh, which uh, figured in about a 1.6% uh, increase over the, over the CR of about $740 billion. Um, woefully short uh, and unacceptable. And it was known to be unacceptable unaccept when, uh, when it was printed. Uh, so here we are looking at the prospect of having to deal with a full year CR in the 740 range. But we have a bipartisan bicameral agreement on the NDAA of $768 billion. Uh, so a lot of good bipartisan bicameral work has already been done. And the number is pretty acceptable, I, I would say. I'm not going to ask all the service chiefs to comment on it. But uh, 740, 768, I, I don't think there would be any doubt uh, where everybody would fall on that particular number, which kind of leaves us, I think, to the legacy riders. Legacy riders that have been in these bills for decades, uh, that have always had bipartisan, bicameral support. So uh, I, I am, frankly, I'm embarrassed as a defense appropriator and as an appropriator in general, uh, that we have allowed uh, that discussion uh, to, uh, to keep us from doing what our constitutional duty is, and that is to provide for the common defense. So it's a bad, bad situation that we're in right now, and, and we've got to overcome it. Uh, and the sooner the better. I think we could get to work on it tomorrow if we could just get some agreement that things that have been in these bills for decades um, deserves to be back in those bills, and that's the only way we're, we're going to get uh, a passage on something other than a, a full-year CR. My only question, I'm going to direct to the Undersecretary, uh, back in 2018, another member of this subcommittee, Derek Kilmer on the other side and myself, uh, participated in a joint select committee on budget process reform. And we spent the better part of the entire year of 2018 looking at the budget process. 
which is in fact part of the problem right now. Um, and we came up with a few ideas and, um, and we got to the finish line in, uh, even though our uh, threshold for passage of anything was, was pretty high, five members on each side of the aisle to come to agreement. Um, and we didn't get there, but that doesn't mean that the work was for naught. So my question for the undersecretary is simply this. One of the reforms that we uh, advocated in that process reform and never got a chance to take to the floors of the House and the Senate was a, a, a biennial budget. So my question for you is this, would changing the process and at least getting us to a point where we could do a two-year budget with, say, annual appropriations, even annual reconciliation, but a biennial budget, how would that help us get past what we're doing here today? Uh, thank you, Congressman. I do remember your, your service on that uh, committee. And as I recall, defense per se was not a big player because you know, it was more focused on something, some of the bigger movers on the entitlement side. But I do recall uh, your, your work on that, and I thank you for it. Uh, Biennial budgeting was looked at, I know, early in my career on the Armed Services Committee in the, in, in the Senate in the 80s. We tried doing biennial authorizations once or twice, uh, had limited sort of consensus with the appropriations committees at that time between the appropriators and authorizers, and it kind of petered out, honestly. Uh, it does offer potential. I, I would love to see us master the art of annual budgeting first, because biennial budgeting is a little harder you know, but uh, I, I recognize that many states do it and, and it can be done. Uh, we would certainly be open to looking at that. I know that there's a commission that has been created by the new authorization bill, newly enacted authorization bill on PPB reform, which is a subset sort of focused on the internal Pentagon part of the process, a little different than what you're saying, but but related. Uh, I think ironically, we, we won't be able to support the standup of that commission under CR. Uh, until until that this issue is resolved, but there there is some movement afoot, I think, on that front, and that commission may well want to expand its purview a little bit beyond the internal Pentagon part of the budget process to take on the very idea that you're mentioning. Might be good work for that commission to take a fresh look at, also. Well, we would like to continue to elevate that discussion because anything is better than where we are today, and and uh, hopefully we'll. Uh, We'll eventually get there. Anyway, I thanks my thanks to the panelists today. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity. I yield back. You are so welcome, Ms. Kilpatrick, Mr. Carter, and then Mr. Kilmer. Thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member, uh, for having this hearing, and thank you to all the witnesses who have taken the time to appear before the committee. I I appreciate your testimony. I appreciate the time that you've spent with us. Uh, as you know, this is a really uh, important hearing in terms of my district. Uh, Admiral Gilday touched on hypersonics, and I understand that the Army expects its hypersonic weapon to be ready by fiscal year 2023 and is investing significant resources to make that a reality. Important research and development activities for hypersonic weapons are conducted in my district and our committee appreciates how critical these programs are for our national security. So General McConville or General Martin, either one of you, uh, the entire department has focused on increasing resources on hypersonic weapons in recent years. I know you are on an aggressive track to field the first system by fiscal year 2023. So can you please describe to us what a delay in appropriations does to your schedule? Congresswoman, thank you. Uh, so as it pertains to the first battery, the first battery field in 2023, uh, no impact. However, a $100 million, $111 million shortfall in 22 resulting from uh, the uh, CR will delay the initial operating capability of our second battery from 2025 to 2026. In addition, uh, the Army won't have the necessary funds to produce this year as we planned the training rounds, think uh, just the, tr the training rounds so that the units can, uh, can uh, use those rounds to train on 
in preparation for uh, executing their, their jobs in a, in, a, in a live environment. And so there would be a delay on that as well. But those are the two significant delays to the hypersonics uh, program, in addition to what Admiral Gilday described previously in his testimony pertaining to the technical delays. So now I, mean, I just want to shift gears just a little bit to the uh, next generation interceptor. The next generation interceptor program is required to provide the United States homeland coverage from incoming intercontinental ballistic missile attacks in the 2030 timeframe. Uh, these are ground based. So under Secretary McCord, in the case of a year long CR, how would programs like NGI have to pivot and adjust? And then my second question for you is give us an understanding of how contracts might need to be modified to reflect less funding and what impact that would have on the bottom line of these programs. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, on the next generation interceptor, since that program is in a somewhat earlier stage, it's got the, the flexibility that R&D has if there is not a new start involved and i would have to i will get to, uh, a response to you for the record as to whether there's a new start issue specific to that program with respect to the contracting the the probably the most common thing that people do is either delay a contract award until if there is a new start issue they have no choice but to delay a contract award or to shorten a period of performance uh, so there are ways that basically it's part of the hidden inefficiency of this of the, of the CR process is the workarounds, you know, the job will get done in a less efficient way and, and possibly more costly way. But uh, there are contracting modifications, contracting and, and budgeting, of course, are in our process a little bit two separate things. And uh, there are multiple ways that one can contract for something depending on, you know, on the circumstance. But the lack of funding is something that no contracting mechanism can can by itself overcome. Okay, thank you. Um, and and can you can you address a little bit how this is going to affect the bottom line of these programs? Well, both with respect to hypersonics, and I think General Raymond also made some great points in his opening statement about, about the Space Force generally, is the areas where you're trying to go the fastest, where you have the most change, are, what's, are what is impacted the most by the requirement that you do what you did last year at the rate that you did it last year, at the funding level that you did, you did it last year. So hypersonics is, is a great example across several of the services, and I think several of the chiefs could probably respond to this on, with respect to their own program where the fact that we're trying to make more progress, that's where we're hurt the most. Thank you very much. And Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Um, next, we go to Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter and then Mr. Kilmer. And then to close up, it'll be Mr. diaz Ballard, Mr. Everholt. Mr. Carter. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, you know, we've got some members of Congress who don't know come back from Sikkim about the appropriations process. They make stupid comments about what would be good for this country. Uh, that may be the purpose of educating them this particular hearing. Uh, everyone in the appropriations committee, we do not like CRs. And we do not want long or short term CRs. We like to finish our work on time and put together our product for the benefit of the country. And I think that what somebody said in the newspaper shouldn't be driving our us at all. But I want to thank all of you for being here. You know, Martin, I want to thank you for telling everybody about the importance of training. Training keeps soldiers alive. The, the inability to train makes a soldier not as prepared. And that, that's very important. You know, we've got a trying to rebuild the modernization of the United States Army. The things we're looking into, the, the big six priorities are long range fire, next generation combat vehicle, future vertical lift, network, air, and missile defense, and soldier neutrality. 
tell me. And then you realize that nobody wants a CR. What would a CR do for that? General Martin. Thank you, Congressman. It's good to see you as always. Uh, so everyone, well, like I, like I, there's 24 programs that we're supposed to have in the hands in one form, fashion, or another uh, in, in 2023. Uh, 19 of those 24 programs, the timeline for those activities to land those in formations would be affected. So it's a huge effect to our modernization effort. Uh, you know, you're from the state of Texas and you know all about Army Futures Command and you understand what they've done with Project Convergence in 2021. We've got a lot of momentum going with that with the Joint Force. And next year, we're to focus on multinational partners. Uh, our efforts would be severely impacted with a CR because there's funding that we've asked for in 22 that will help us set conditions to execute Project Convergence 22 that we won't be able to put our hands on. And so all the progress we've made over time for the past two years will be slowed at best could be potentially stopped. And as uh, my colleagues have said multiple times, our adversaries are not having the same problems uh, with consistent, predictable, timely uh, funding uh, for these various programs. And so uh, project convergence is huge for the United States Army, and we've got to have the funding to be able to do that. And without any anomalies and the ability to reprogram, it will it will be virtually impossible to do that. And so I look, I, I sincerely urge Congress to uh, move forward with appropriating the FY22 budget. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kilmer. Can you hear me? Mr. Uh, you, you've got a minute left. I thought you said you okay, all... I accidentally hit the wrong button. Oh, okay. I can I just want to say that the Odierno family, Mary and I have thoughts and prayers. Oh. That family has given an awful lot to the United States and an awful lot to the United States Army. And we all ought to be thinking about to get the sacrifices the entire Odierno family has given for our nation. I'm proud to call them my friends. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I reflect those words. Well said, Mr. Carter, and thank you so much for saying them. Appreciate it. Um, Mr. Kilmer. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and thanks to uh, all the witnesses for being with us. I had um, two questions, and they're both for Admiral uh, Gilday. Um, First of all, I, I, I know I don't need to emphasize to you the importance of the Shipyard Infrastructure Optimization Program, or PSYOP, the Navy's 20-year, 20 $21 billion dollar effort to upgrade and modernize our public shipyards. I, I very much appreciate your past statements in support of this program. I, I applaud the Navy for appointing Rear Admiral McClelland uh, as the head of the PSYOP program office. I was lucky enough to meet with him earlier this week. He provided some valuable insights into the program, and I'm, I'm glad to see the Navy showing its commitment to, to the PSYOP with, with his appointment. Um, I think it's a big deal as we look to restore and reinvest in our public shipyards, including Puget Sound Naval Shipyard in my neck of the woods. But knowing the importance of the PSYOP and also reading all of your testimony about the impact and the potential impact of a, a CR, um, not just on operations, but on military construction as well. I, I worry that any CR related impacts to the program could lead, lead to a situation in which maintenance drives operations instead of maintenance supporting operations. So with that in mind, can you just share what impact the uh, a full year CR would have on the PSYOP? Uh, yes, sir. There's a, there's a few areas we're going to see impacts. The first would be uh, in the ongoing project at Portsmouth Naval Shipyard up in New Hampshire and Maine. And so uh, on my unfunded list, I requested $225 million for a phase project up there for a dry dock. It needs to be revitalized because there are actually single-digit days a year when we can bring a ship in and out of dry dock there. Uh, our dry docks, uh, the 18 of them across our four shipyards, the average age is 97 years old. We haven't touched them in a century. This is once-in-a-century work. The new Virginia-class submarines that we're building, they're longer. They have a payload section in them uh, that brings considerable lethality to the fight. Uh, and so because they're bigger and the dry docks, uh, they, 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 they're they they're too large for the dry docks. And so 
for that particular uh, dry dock up there in Portsmouth, we need to finish that project in time for 28 to get the first subject, uh, the first uh, Virginia class in the East Coast in maintenance, uh, and that'll be delayed. Uh, and we're not sure how specifically we'd be able to mitigate that delay. Separately, we're in the process of identifying and hiring 42 subject matter experts who are coming from industry, real patriots, to join this effort. Uh, and that the hiring of those individual be, individuals will be delayed. We'll do the best we can to try and uh, to try and entice them to to stay with us, but I think it's it's going to be difficult. As you're aware, besides the dry dock work, we're also trying to accelerate uh, infrastructure work. So these are these shipyards, because they're over 100 years old, are like Frankenstein's in a way that we've just added buildings, and so they're very inefficient with respect to workflow of pump work, uh, valve work uh, that flows through these yards. And so we're taking a look at through modeling how we can best recapitalize this infrastructure in a way that's uh, that, that accelerates, uh, that, that gives us the best efficiency, the best optimization. And it'll delay that work that we're trying to do uh, for infrastructure. So this is MILCON and, and also projects that fall below the MILCON level that would allow us to reinvest in, in critical infrastructure. It'll delay that as well, probably uh, one to two years, sir. And I'll, I'll pause there. Let me, um, if I could, uh, Admiral, in your written testimony, you also mentioned the impacts of a CR on the operations of our public and private shipyards and specifically referenced some of the potential delays or cancellations of maintenance, um, maintenance availabilities for uh, five attack subs, two carriers, and just the cascading impacts that we'll have on our shipyard maintenance availabilities well into the future. I hope you could just expand on some of those written comments and provide the committee some additional insight into those future delays to maintenance availabilities under a potential year-long CR. And how will these maintenance availability delays and cancellations impact our capability to compete with China and other near-peer competitors? Sir, you, you said it very aptly when you said it. What, what it creates is a situation where you have maintenance leading operations, which is not where you want to be. And so our availabilities, our maintenance availabilities for those nuclear-powered vessels are really planned uh, toe to heel. As soon as we're done with one, we're bringing in the next. That's, that's the way the production line works. That's how we're most efficient. And this is going to cause a perturbation. And we saw this during sequestration, and we're still catching up a decade later. We can't afford to do that based on where we are now with China for all the reasons my contemporaries and Secretary McCord stated earlier. And so this is going to this is going to cause a perturbation that we're yet we're still unraveling in terms of operational schedules to keep carrier strike groups and amphibious ready groups on point in the Western Pacific and beyond. I'll, I'll pause there, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you. I was looking on the screen to see Mr. Diaz Ballard. Mr. Diaz Ballard, are you present to ask a question? Sometimes people turn their cameras off. I'll give him another minute. Or Mr. Adderholt, if you're there, you can certainly go. It appears, Mr. Calvert, that those members are not there. Do you conf do you confer with that? Uh, apparently not. So, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, so, if you'd like to uh, make a, a closing summary statement, I'll make I'll make mine, uh, sir. Sure. Sure. Um, thank you. Um, I appreciate the witnesses uh, being here today, and uh, uh, we've we've had a lot of difficulties of late in trying to get these appropriation bills complete, and uh, that's unfortunate and while we're doing that we've seen our adversaries become bolder because weakness is provocative certainly our hasty withdrawal from afghanistan was a signal to the world that this administration will abandon our allies risk the lives of u.s service members and even leave u.s citizens behind that was a very unfortunate situation and now we're facing an unfortunate situation both in europe and in taiwan and there's a uh, it's I think our friend, uh, Mr. Churchill said many years ago, the worst two words in English language is too late. So we have a responsibility to get this, uh, get this uh, bill done. I know we all want to get it done. I, and the people say there's not any offers on the table. Well, let me 
let me reiterate uh, what the former chairman of this committee said uh, uh, about revisionist history. We all know that these like the, the framework has always been that these legacy writers uh, remain and these poison pills go out. Uh, that's what happened last year, year before that, and year before that. And so I would hope that that uh, understanding we can get to, to the table and uh, negotiate this bill, bring the defense numbers up, the non-defense discretionary down, and let's get this done by uh, at least February 18th for the men and women who are serving in the United States military. With that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. And um, I, I am not in a position to disagree with everything that's happened in every appropriation committee in the history of uh, humankind here in the United States Capitol, but um, the the conference committees I've been involved in, the writers were left to the end. We had our budget agreement for what our new target was between the House and the Senate that we had to spend up to. And so I, you know, everybody's had different experiences up here, and I just have to say that those have been my experiences. Another um, uh, uh, point I'd like to bring out, and um, yes, um, President Biden's budget came out on May 28th. That was his first budget, his first year as president. President Trump's budget came out on May 23rd. That's a five-day different, but President Biden was dealing with an assault on our Capitol on January 6th, as well as COVID in preparing his budget. So I, I, I just wanted to make sure that everybody understood that all presidents' first year budgets come out a little late. Um, today was an opportunity not only to recommit ourselves as appropriators on this subcommittee, but on uh, the full committee, which we all serve, to get our job done on time. And, uh, and now to really push leadership to make sure that we um, finish this appropriations process by the February date that we've agreed to. Um, I want to also say that this was an opportunity, I believe, to educate our colleagues, those who don't understand the work that we do, the impacts that CRs have. And as many of my colleagues on the other side said, CRs are just not a good idea. We are all in agreement with that. Gentlemen, I want to thank you all for being here today. I want to thank you for your testimony. I also would like you to pass on our thanks to those who serve in uniform and the civilians who serve alongside of you. Your work is very much appreciated, and we know that the work you do keeps us safe um, here at home and keeps democracy's beacon abroad lit well. This concludes today's proceeding. And as I said, once again, from all of us, thank you to all of our witnesses and members for an enlightening discussion. And let's get, let's get the bills for appropriations passed this February. Thank you very much. And with that, the meeting is adjourned. The hearing is adjourned. Thank you.